We're on module five for the head, neck, and neurological lecture. So the objectives for this is you're going to learn how to prepare for an exam for the HEENT exam. You're going to learn how to collect subjective and objective data for the following ears, eyes, nose, and sinus, mouth, and neck. And then I'll, always you're going to document your findings. So let's start with the head, the structure and function of the head. So initially you're going to inspect the skull, face, and hair. You're going to look at the position, the size, shape, contour of the skull, hair distribution. Now the skull is a rigid box that protects our brain and it's supported by the cervical vertebrae. So as you see here, let's see if this works. I got this new little, oh, it didn't work. Bummer, that's okay. Um, so what I was showing you was the actual vertebrae right here. Okay, and then you have your cranial bones. So you have your parietal bone, you have your occipital bone, which is in the back, you have your temporal bone, which is on the side, and then you have your frontal bone. So there's two pairs of salivary glands that are accessible to, on an examination for the face. There's a parietic glands, they're in the cheeks over the mandible. So right here, here is the parietic gland, so right next to the cheeks. They're the largest of the salivary glands. Normally they're not palpable. Then you have the submandibular glands, they're beneath the jaw. So beneath the mandible of the angle of the jaw. So right here. So the third pair of the sublingual glands, they lie in the floor of the mouth. Okay, right there. And then you have your temporal artery, which lies superior to the temporalis muscle. And this you can palpate, and you guys are learning this, that you can palpate right here, and you can feel it. Now, again, you're going to palpate the head for any nodules or any masses. You're going to gently rotate your fingertips down the center of the scalp along the side of the head. The expected findings is the face and the scalp will be uniform in color. It will be smooth with no lesions, no edema. Um, there's no any abnormal findings. The facial features are symmetric. The they relax facial expressions. That you can also see that they're symmetric as well. Now there's some variations. So there might be some slight asymmetry of uh, facial features. Okay, that's expected. Uh, dry, brittle, and thinning hair expected with aging. So, as you can see here, for her, she has like a little crease here, but yet she doesn't have it here. Okay, now if I took a line here, I could say it is completely symmetric, but maybe it's off just a little bit. But I would say this is a symmetric face, symmetric smile, I guess you could say. Unexpected findings is the facial features are asymmetric, so the, um, there's a cranial nerve that is paralyzed, so the facial, uh, the facial nerve. There could be lumps, protrusions, or sunken areas of the scalp that could mean trauma. Lesions, redness on the face or scalp could be a skin disorder or there's an infection. Patchy hair loss, now this could be due to an autoimmune disorder. Paraordinal edema that could be due to um, trauma as well. A tense facial expression, maybe they're having uh, a lot of pain, but you have to investigate a little bit more. Facial hair of females, this is going to be an endocrine disorder or it could be hormonal. So looking at his face, okay, he's smiling. Or would you say this is symmetric or asymmetric? I'm gonna say this is asymmetric and this is a concern. So he doesn't have a crease here, okay? And as you can tell, he has the little skin wrinkles here when he smiles, but yet he doesn't have it here. Uh, patchy hair, okay? Again, it could be an autoimmune disorder. And then you have the um, facial hair on a female. Now, again, this could be due to a hormonal imbalance or it could be just an endocrine disorder. So let's go back to this gentleman. So this gentleman is having an asymmetric facial feature, so an unequal movement. So he's smiling. The subjective data I want to know initially is when did the drooping start? 
Are you having difficulty with your vision, any blurry vision, double, any blind spots? Difficulty swallowing. Now, if he was having difficulty swallowing, he's going to be NPO. What does NPO stand for again? Nothing by mouth. Now, is this a gradual onset or is it rapid? And then have the symptoms gone worse or better? So I want to ask the client to smile. This is how I'm going to assess him. Ask him to smile. I want to see the teeth. Assess for the unequal movement and the absent of the nasal labial fold. So right here, the smile line. I want him to puff out his cheeks. So just like so, like a blowfish. You're going to press the cheeks and observe the equal air escaping from each side. It should be equal. You're going to have them raise their eyebrows like they're surprised. They're like, oh. Okay, observe for the wrinkles on the forehead. Are they equal? You're going to have them close and open up their eyes. I want to see if they can do this. Now, again, facial drooping, so orientation and comprehension. Are they alert? Speech, is it clear? Are they using the correct words? Are they following commands? Is there any limb paralysis or any awareness of that paralysis? Have them lift and hold each arm and leg, okay? for 10 seconds at least. Now you may see them have a droop, okay? Or a drip, I'm sorry. They may have a drip. They may be forcing that leg to try and get up. But if you see that, you have to know. They're gonna to be touching their arms and legs bilaterally, or you're gonna to be touching their arms and legs bilaterally. Now, can they feel that? So not just a one spot, all the way down. Does this feel the same or does it feel different? Does this feel the same or does it feel different? Do you have any numbness or tingling in that arm? Be very specific on those questions. Touch their fingers to their nose. So you're going to have your finger here and then you're going to ask them to touch their nose and touch your finger. You want to see if they're able to follow the command and their coordination. Heel to shin. So I'll show you. So you're going to have them take their heel Okay, rub it up against their shin just like so. Now your client is laying down, and I want to see if they're able to do that coordination and they're able to lift it up and down. Um, can they use the limbs on both sides? Are they able to even use them? Vital signs, okay, gather your vital signs document your findings, and you have to notify your doctor immediately if you suspect a stroke. If you suspect a stroke, you must, you must immediately notify your doctor. These clients who have facial drooping or any limb paralysis or if they're unable to do something neurologically, they're a high fall risk. Reorient the client, so time and place. All right, so now let's talk about the neck. So we're going to inspect the neck for the position of the trachea. The trachea should be midline. So hers is right here, so you can see how it is midline. It's not shifted. What's your overall skin color of the neck? It should be even with the face, okay? It should be all even. The stiffness of her neck, is she able to have full mobility in her neck? And does she have pain with it? Is she able to swallow? Okay, positions. So there's a neutral position. So this is our normal position, hopefully. And then there's the hyperextended position, heads all the way back, and then swallowing. Are they able to swallow? Now, if patients are having difficulty swallowing, they feel like there's a food bolus and it's getting stuck, if they tuck in their chin to their chest and then try and swallow, they will actually help move that food down the passage. So expected findings, so you have the major neck muscles, the sternomastoid and the trapezius. Then you have your trachea, okay, midline. You're being able to move your neck forward, backwards, side to side without any pain or any difficulty. You're able to swallow your secretions and fluid without any difficulty or and you don't choke. So if I just give a patient just to see how their swallowing is, swallowing is, and I gave them, let's say, 30 cc's, so it's 30 milliliters. Patient drinks it, and then they go, <coughs> they actually might be having a hard time swallowing that little bit of water. So you have to ask your client, 
do you have a hard time swallowing water? Be like, oh yeah, I always have to clear my throat after I drink it. Okay, those are things you have to inspect. But normally an expected finding is that they're able to drink without any difficulty um, and they don't choke. Unexpected findings with the neck is they have limited range of motion. Maybe they can only go this far. Maybe they can't go this far. They can't put their head down all the way because they have pain. Their trachea has been shifted okay, from midline. Maybe it's deviated to the right, deviated to the left. It could be due to a chest disorder or it could be there's a mass in their neck. Um, swelling on the anterior portion of their neck. So here, you see there's swelling right here. Now that could be due to an enlarged thyroid. Maybe there's a mass. Um, visible lymph nodes. Now if there's visible lymph nodes, maybe it's malignancy or there's an infection. So here is his lymph node right there. So it's visible. And then difficulty swallowing. Again, it could be due to a stroke central nervous system disorder, or due to inflammation. So we have to investigate that. So assessment of the neck. So if there's a lump detected on the anterior neck, you have to gather that subjective data. How long has the lump been there? Is it causing discomfort? Do you have any difficulty swallowing or a change to your voice? Difficulty breathing? I'm going to inspect. Observe for any respiratory distress. If you see your client in respiratory distress, they have tachypnea, increased, um, like, oh, I'm sorry, increased respiratory rate, which is tachypnea, inability to speak a sentence without taking a breath, or they're using their accessory muscles right here, and they're like, <gasps> okay, and they're really struggling, you're going to stop everything you're doing, and you're going to do an emergency. You're going to call a rapid response, okay? That is just gathering people there more people in your room so you're not alone. You're gathering the right people so you can get assistance for this client. But if they're not having an emergency distress, you're gonna continue. You're gonna auscultate. Auscultate over the strider for, or auscultate over the trachea for a strider. Now, if you hear a strider, we're gonna talk about that. It's more of a one tone musical sound. So it's a e that could be an airway obstruction. Now, if I hear multiple tones like ooh, ooh, that could be a wheeze. Okay, we're going to talk about that in respiratory, but just keep in mind if you hear a strider over the trachea, it could be due to an airway obstruction. And then again, document your findings and then report to your provider so then you can do the plan of care. So then the structures and function of the thyroid. So the thyroid gland is a very important endocrine gland that straddles the trachea in the middle of the neck. So right here you see the thyroid. It's the pink, right there. So what does the thyroid do? It synthesizes and secretes T4 and T3. Those are hormones that stimulate the rate of cellular metabolism. The gland has two lobes connected in the middle of the thin is isthmus and above by the cricoid cartilage. So right here is the cricoid cartilage. So how do you assess the thyroid? Now you're going to use an anterior or posterior approach. So first locate the isthmus below the cricoid cartilage, lower half of the neck, okay, just like how they are. So first you can do it posteriorly find it, and then you're going to note the size, the shape, any nodules, do they have tenderness. Normal size is not visible. If you hyperextend, you could get a better visual. You're going to palpate when the client swallows. So ask them to swallow, and you'll feel it move up with the trachea. Again, you're feeling for any um, masses, you're feeling for the size and the smoothness. After you've done your palpating, you're going to auscultate the thyroid for a brewy. Now a brewy is more, it's a swooshing or a blowing sound. So this could be due to hyperthyroidism. So they have too much thyroid. 
um, especially if their thyroid is enlarged, that could be due to um, hyperthyroidism. Now, when you're auscultating for a brewery, you're going to be using the bell of your stethoscope, not your diaphragm. So which part is your bell on your stethoscope? It is your smaller ring. So now let's talk about the structure and function of the lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system is an extensive vessel system, the major part of the immune system. It detects and eliminates foreign substances from the body. So there's vessels that allow the flow of clear, waterly fluid from the tissue spaces into circulation. So the nodes are small, okay? Um, so they prevent potential harmful substance from entering the circulation. The greatest supply of the, of the lymphatic system we have is in our head and our neck. We should, you should start getting really familiar with the direction of the drainage patterns of the lymph nodes. Um, there is an ATI adult physical assessment video on this. This is very good. So you can pause this and go into your ATI skills 2.0 under physical assessment of the adult and then go to step-by-step -step viewing and you'll be able to actually watch the physical assessment of how to do a, um, a lymph, lymph node assessment. Now, this is the drainage patterns of the lymph nodes. Now, if you look at this picture here, it has one, two, three, you see that. But I really want you to focus on the different order, okay, a different order, ATI's order. So ATI's order is you're going to start with oxidable, okay? Number two is going to be the post-articular nodes. Then you have your pre-ocular nodes, so that's number three. Then you have your tonsillar nodes. Then you have your submandibular. Then you have your submental, I'm trying to label them for you. Anterior cervical. Then you have your posterior cervical. And then you have your supraclavicular, which is number nine. Okay. So just look through these and you're going to be practicing these with your classmates because there's a possible check off on this. So make sure you know the drainage patterns of the lymph nodes. So which ones go down, which ones goes up. So the lymph nodes, they're difficult to palpate, usually non-tender and you can't see them. You're gonna use the pads of your index and your middle finger in a circular motion. You're gonna do both sides at the same time. And it's a very gentle pressure. Now, if you feel an enlarged load, your lo load, an enlarged node, you're gonna note the location, the tenderness, the size, shape, consistency, mobility, and then is it warm? So assessments of lymph nodes again, so your expected findings of gentler circular motion of your finger pads. They're movable, discrete, soft, and non-tender. Unexpected is if there's tenderness, enlarged. If there's any nodes that are palpable, again, note the location, size, shape, and tenderness and their mobility. If the large or tender, check the area that they're draining, okay? So check, are the area that is draining is the source of the problem, possibly. It could be due to inflammation. When you cannot find a source of the problem, okay, that deserves prompt attention, because is it malignancy or is it inflammation? So an enlarged lymph node, so greater than one centimeter, could be due to an infection, allergy, or neoplasm. An infection, nodes are enlarged bilaterally, warm, tender, firm, but movable. Now, structures of our mouth. So you're going to first inspect, inspect their teeth, inspect their tongue, their hard and soft palate, tonsils, uvula. So I want to make sure their teeth, they have, do they have all of them? Now, what's their color, their condition? How about their tongue? Do they have any lesions? When you have their stick their tongue out, 
Is it midline? You're going to hear midline a lot. Hard and soft palate. What's the color, the condition? Is there any lesions? Are they intact? Tonsils. Again, is there exudate and large color? And then uvula. There should be a symmetrical rise. So the expected findings of our mouth, the lips should be moist, symmetric, and smooth. The color for pale skin, so darker skin, should be pink. For a darker skin client, it should be more of a plum color. The teeth should be smooth and shiny. Older adults could be having darker teeth, okay, the darker in color due to staining. They could also be missing teeth due to the increased bone reabsorption. The mucosa should be glistening, smooth, and moist. Older adults, there's hyperpigmentation and dryness due to a decreased salvation. The gums, they should be moist and smooth and non-tender. Now, dark skin clients may have a patchy pigmentation on their gums. Older adults, they can have a pale pigmentation as well. The tongue should be moist, slightly rough, medium red color. The hard palate, okay, it should be a dome shape, whitish in color. The soft palate should be smooth, a light pink. The tonsils, they should be pink and smooth. Now, unexpected findings for the mouth, the tongue swollen or dark red. This could be due to a low vitamin B12. Or they might have thrush. It's an oral fungal infection. So this is a good, um, good view of thrush. Swelling of the gums, conjunctivitis. Hard palate, a yellow discoloration of their hard palate could be due to a liver disorder. Uvula, they could be due to sore throat, could be red. Maybe there's an infection. The mucosa or lip, painful round ulcers with a white base, that could be a canker sore. So older adult expected changes for the mouth. So they have a decreased taste, decreased salvation. They lose their teeth. Their gums are pale. They could have gum disease due to the poor oral hygiene. Their teeth are darkening due to staining. Now I want you to think about how could these affect nutrition and safety? How could these affect nutrition and safety? Okay, so now let's talk about nose and sinuses. So first you're going to inspect the external nose. I'm looking for the size and shape and the color. I'm looking at the skin integrity. Is there any inflammation? And when I'm look, inspecting and palpating their nose and looking inside their nose and their nasal mucosa, I'm going to be wearing gloves because what if they have drainage? Um, I'm also looking at the integrity of the opening. I'm using a pen light to look. Now there's sinuses. There's the frontal, the frontal sinuses, which is on the top of the forehead. Then there's the maxillary. Okay. Now here's a good picture on how they're doing. Now this woman is not wearing gloves, but he probably doesn't have drainage. Now if there is drainage, I'm going to be wearing gloves. Now she just lifts up his nose and is looking inside of his nasal. And he's looking at the mucosa for color and the integrity. Now for the nose, nose and sinuses, you're gonna we're gonna palpate. The expected finding when we're palpating the sinuses and the nose that there's no tenderness. The nose should be symmetric. The nasal, the near, the nares mucosa should be smooth and moist. Older adults, they lose cartilage, okay, the elasticity. Now the lengthening of their nose can lengthen okay their nose are going to be lengthened and their tip is going to be lowering that's due to because of the loss of cartilage um now this could cause a decreased airflow and the ability to smell so unexpected findings for sinuses would be tenderness with palpation pale mucosa okay with clear drainage that could be due to allergies if they have a bright red nasal mucosa, that could be due to an upper respiratory infection. If there's yellow or green drainage, so DC means discharge, that could be due to a sinus cavity infection. Okay, so let's talk about if the client says they are having sinus congestion or pain, how are you going to assess them? 
Again, you're going to collect that subjective data. Do you have nasal discharge or a runny nose? What's the color, the odor? How long have you been having discharge? Are you having any sinus pain or pressure in your face? And point to exactly where it's at. Um, do they have any problems breathing? So when you're inspecting, you're looking at the color of the nasal mucosa. You're using a pen light and possibly wearing gloves if there's drainage. When you're palpating, you're using your thumbs. And initially, you're just palpating to see if there's tenderness on both of the sinuses. And then you're going to firmly, okay, press firmly when um, upward and in when you're doing the um, sinuses. So if you're doing frontal, you're going to go just underneath the eyebrows right here. And you're going to press firmly upwards in a motion just underneath the eyebrows, okay? Be aware to not press too hard because if you're pressing too hard, maybe too low, you're putting pressure on the actual eye. Now, if you're doing the maxillary, you're going to do your thumbs and you're going to be pressing inward. Um, again, refer back to Health Assess. There's a video underneath this module regarding the technique. Now, interventions. Is someone having sinus congestion or pain? Now, I'm looking at nursing interventions and what I would do. So, what would you do for yourself for sinus congestion or pain? I'm going to get a humidifier. Maybe a warm compress over that area with my head elevated. I'm going to avoid triggers. So, if this is an allergy problem, I'm going to avoid it. I'm going to wash my hands frequently. And then I'm going to try and keep up my fluids two to three liters a day because increasing the fluids intake is going to actually thin out the mucus secretions. And then always document. Document your findings and notify your doctor with any abnormal findings. So older adults um, expected finding, uh, they're going to have a decreased sense of smell. Now, how does this impact the older adult? What do you think? How does a decreased sense of smell impact an older adult? How would it impact you? The structure and function of the ear. So what is the function of our ear? It's so we can hear. So here is the external ear. Oh, let me get my pen. This is the external ear here. What breaks off the middle and the external ear is actually the tympanic membrane right here. Now, but what's out here? This is the actual external ear, and it's mainly of movable cartilage and skin. So as we know, we can move our ears. Um, you have the pinna, okay, the pinna. You're going to pull the pinna, okay, when you're going to assess a patient, and we're going to go over that. Now let's talk about that tympanic membrane because that is also called the eardrum. It separates the external and the middle ear. It's a translucent membrane and with a pearly gray color. It should be intact, no tears. So it should just look just like this. So when we're in lab this week, you guys are going to be looking at each other's tympanic membranes and you're going to see that beautiful pearly gray color. It should be an oval, slightly concave, and it's pulled into the center uh, by one of the middle ear's ossicles. Now, an abnormal would be otitis media, which is a bulging tympanic membrane, which is an ear infection. It could be red, painful. So an acute otitis media, that's the ear infection. Now, to talk about ear infections and how does it occur? Now, within the middle ear, again, the tympanic membrane separates the middle versus the middle and the external ear. Now, see here, we're going to talk about this picture. This is a child, an infant. See how their eustachian tube is very parallel? And then rather an adult, it kind of dips down. That is why children are more prone to be getting ear infections than adults, because this fluid isn't, it's not draining. It actually just stays right around here and that's causing that, that ear infection. So whereas us, we're having that drainage, okay, here, and it's not just pocketing here. Now for children, 
Um, if they constantly have ear infections, chronic ear infections, then they will possibly get eustachian tubes, ear tubes. So, which is just very small, literally is like the size of this, maybe even smaller, and they put them in and it allows the drainage. So let's talk about the middle ear function. So the middle ear conducts sound vibrations from the outer ear to control hearing apparatus in the inner ear. It protects the inner ear by reducing the amplitude of loud sounds. Again, the eustachian tube is the opening that connects the middle ear with the nasal pharynx and allows the passage of air. It's normally closed, but it opens with swallowing and yawning. The inner ear, so the inner ear really helps our sensory organs for equilibrium and hearing. So within the inner ear, it's not accessible to direct examination, but its function can be assessed. How would you assess someone's inner ear function? Are they listening to you? How's their equilibrium? So if I'm assessing the ear, I want to be eye level with them. Pull the arcule, so the pinna up and back for adults when you're assessing it, and then down and back for younger children. You're going to assess the following. Can the client hear and participate in the conversation appropriately? How is the size and shape of the ear? You're looking for both sides. The color and condition of the skin, is there any lumps, lesions, or trauma? Is there any edema, serum, or drainage? So some auditory tests that we'll be practicing, one is called the whisper test. So they're going to include one ear at a time, stand behind them, okay? And they're going to whisper something very simple. One, two, three, A, B, C, dog, cat, dog. The client must repeat it back. So that is the whisper test. So again, they're going to be including one ear. You're standing behind them and you're just whispering something very simple and they're going to repeat it back. Then there's the rind test. The rind test is using a tuning fork on the mastoid. Okay, the client states when there's no longer can hear the sound. So there's bone conduction. So the tuning fork, let's say, let's turn this guy on. Let's say this is the tuning fork. You're going to find your mastoid. Where is your mastoid? Okay, you're going to find the mastoid. So, and what happens is you take the tuning fork, you just gently do a tap and you can slightly hear the ring and you put it right on the mastoid against the bone and the client's going to let you know when they can no longer hear the sound. Then you move to the front of the ear and the client's going to let you know when he can no longer hear that sound. That's air conduction, okay? So it's just slightly. So if you see here in this picture, bone conduction called BC, and then AC, air conduction. And we're going to talk more about this in class, but this is just to get you a little ready. Then there's the Weber's test. So the tuning fork is centered on the temporal bone. Can the client hear? best in the right, left, or both ears. So again, hit the tuning fork, put it right on the top of the head. Now can they hear it in both right or left? Okay. Now expected is they'll be able to hear both of the sounds or the sound in both ears. Conductive loss, so the sounds lateralize to the poorer ear. Um, causes could be otitis media, such as an ear infection. Fluid in the middle of the ear, cold allergies, um, if they have a lot of ear wax, or very an object. So looking at the ear, um, expected findings, so it's external. We're looking, um, there could be some ear wax that is visible at the opening of the ear canal. The size of the ears are symmetric. The skin is intact. Now, if we're looking internally, their tympanic membrane is pearly gray color. It's not bulging. Um, unexpected findings would be eczema. They may have crust or scanning on their ears. There could be redness, inflammation or fever, crusty or purulent drainage. Redness or edema could mean an infection. If there's bright red blood or watery discharge following a trauma, they may have a fracture to the base of their skull. 
Now, if someone's having excessive ear drainage or pain, I'm going to ask them the following questions. Are you having ringing or buzzing in their ears? Is it constant? Does it come and go? And then you're going to do the PQRST for their pain. Any changes in the ability to hear? Any recent head injuries? Um, any lightheadedness? Do they feel dizzy? Is the room spinning? And then objective when you're asking these questions, are they answering the questions appropriately? Do they turn their head so the good ear is facing towards you so they can hear you? Or do they watch you really closely and just watch your lips? Now, when we're speaking, um, we're speaking in a normal tone, okay? We're not shouting. We may use a lower pitch, but is the client using an abnormal, loud, or flat monotone voice? And again, you're inspecting. You're inspecting the outer ear for redness, edema, any drainage. And then you're inspecting the inner ear or the middle ear for that tympanic main membrane. Are they able, or is that tympanic membrane nice, curly, and gray color? Palpation. So you can palpate the external of the ear to see if there's any warmth, any pain, or also can you see any edema? So older adult expected changes. They may have their earlobes with that wrinkly because they have that loss of elasticity of their pinna. They're going to have that coarse, wiry hair that may be present at the opening of the canal. Now, their tympanic membrane is going to be thickened. So the eardrum normally may appear like whiter in a color, um, but an opaque. So but it's duller and thicker than a younger adult. Now, they're going to have some possible hearing loss, high tone frequency loss, apparent for those with, the, they're affected with presbyscuses, which is a central neural um, hearing loss. And this is a normal thing that occurs with aging. Um, it can be revealed in difficult hearing whispered words in the voice test. They're not able to hear that whisper test very well. The, Um, they have a high accumulation of serum, so the earwax. Now, a lot of times they may feel isolated because they can't hear. Um, so what do you think about how could this affect the older adult's life? What do you think? Put yourself in their shoes. How do you think that this could affect them? So aging adults may feel like people are mumbling around them. They feel isolated um, in friends or in family or friendship groups because they really, they can't hear due to because of the expected changes. So the structure and function of the eye, what is the function of the eye? The function of the eye is so we can see. So you have a bony orbital cavity that is surrounded by cushion fat that protects our eye. So you have your eyelids. The upper eyelid is more mobile than the lower. The purpose of our eyelids is to help protect our eyes from injury, strong light, or dust. So here's your upper eyelid right here. And here's your lower. Okay. So then you have your palpable fissure, so the elliptical um, open space between the eyelids, so right here. So when closed, okay, the lid margins approximate completely. They try, they close completely so nothing can get in there. When the open, the upper lid covers part of the iris, and that's expected right there. So the lower lid margin at the limbus, it borders between the cornea and the sclera. So again, the sclera is that wider part and it should be that pearly white color. So the canthus is the corner of the eye, so angle where the lids meet. There's that one. And then you have the inner canthus, okay. So the inner canthus, um, it's very small. And this actually, the sebaceous glands are there. And then you have your eyelashes. So your eyelashes are just short hairs, double or triple rows that curve outward from the lid. Um, it helps with dust and dirt. Right there.
Okay, so let's talk about a little bit more about the structure and function of the eye. You have the tarsal plate, so they're within the upper lid. They're strips of connective tissue. They contain some glands. So the one gland that we talked about is the meibomin gland. Okay, so if you see here, they're right around here. Okay. So they're modified sebaceous glands. They secrete an oily lubricating material onto our lids. It helps stop the tears from overflowing. It helps also form an airtight seal when our lids are closed. Then you have the conjunctiva right here. That's a transparent protective covering that's exposed part of the eye. You have your cornea. It covers and protects the iris and pupil. And then you have your lacrimal gland. So it secretes tears. So here's just another viewing for you to look at. And another one, you can see the conjunctiva. So within the eye, we have a lot of muscles. We have um, the extraocular muscles. So this ha helps move our eyes side to side, up and down, laterally, and they're stimulated by three cranial nerves. So I'm gonna let you guys take a look at this, at the directions. We're gonna talk about this in class, but just looking at the directions and where the eye movement goes. So then if we're talking about the sclera again, it's a tough protective white covering. The cornea, it's very sensitive to touch. If you contact, if you come in contact with it, um, like a tip of a cotton, it stimulates a blink in both eyes. So that's called the corneal reflex. Then you have your choroid, which is a dark pigmentation to prevent light from reflecting internally and have it and it's heavily vascular, vascularized to deliver blood to the retina. Your iris controls the amount of light emitted into the retina. Your pupil is round, rough, and regular, ideally. So it's determined by balance between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic chains of the autonomic nervous system. Then you have your lens. So it's the biconvex disc located posterior to the pupil and it's transparent. Now again on the retina, the visual receptive layer of the eye where the light waves change into nerve impulses. And then at the very, very back, you have your optic disc. So area which the fibers from the retina converge to form the optic nerve. So assessment on the eye. So first you're going to inspect. You're going to stand directly in front of your client at eye level. You're going to ask them to remove their glasses if they wear them. You're going to observe the placement and the appearance of their eyes, eyelashes, eyelids, eyebrows. Are they symmetric? How is the placement? You're going to look at the condition of the tissues that um, comprise the eye structure. And you're going to also look at the client's ability to move their, um, their eyes and also are able to close and open their eyelids. So to look at the conjunctiva, you're going to use your thumb very gently below the lower lid. You're going to retract it very gently. You're just inspecting the sclera and the uh, conjunctiva. You're inspecting the pupil size, shape, and is it symmetric on both sides? Both pupils should be the same. And also you're looking at the client's pupil uh, constriction and dilation. So if someone is looking at an object close to them, their pupils will constrict. And then if a light is shining in their eyes, okay, or even on the side of their eye, their pupils will constrict. And But if they're looking at something in a far object, or if the light is darkened, then their pupils will dilate. So again, with the pupil assessment, so you're going to remember this, parallel. This means pupils equal, so they're equal on both sides. They're round, okay? They're round and not irregular. They're reactive to light. So the pupils react to light and you're gonna determine is it slowly or is it briskly or brisk? And accommodations. So do they accommodate when you're looking from afar to a close object and um, 
vice versa. So again, PERLA is pupils equal round reactive to light and accommodation. So here's just a little picture of pupils equal and react normally, okay? Pupils react to light. So let's say this guy was reacting to light. Someone shined a light right on the side and he constricted. This pupil dilated. Could be due to um, they were looking at a far object or they have bilateral dilated such as fixed pupils. This is a dangerous sign. Or pinpoint pupils, this could mean opioids. So a vision assessment. We're going to be using a Snellen chart to determine your client's vision. So you're gonna have the client stand 20 feet away from the chart. And if they have impaired far vision, so myopia, you're gonna, um, it helps determine if the client has this. So again, a Snellen chart is to test for the visual acuity. So expected finding is 2020. Now, if someone is 2040, the client needs to be 20 feet away from the letter that the person with a normal visual acuity can read. Um, so, but when they're reading the lines, they can only read if a person was actually 40 feet away. Um, so if they're reading, if they have reading glasses on, you're going to ask them to remove them. Uh, the extra ocular mo movement, you're going to do the corneal light reflex. So when you do this, you're going to take your pen light, you're going to shine the light on the eyes, and you're going to see that light on the corneas, and you're going to, it should be the same on both. So you're checking for symmetry on the corneas. Um, cover, uncover test. So we're testing for strabismus, which is cross eye. So you're gonna ask the client to cover one eye, look in a certain direction, then uncover the other eye and expect the eyes to actually look in the same direction. Then there's something called the six cardinal gazes. So you're gonna position the client again, right in front of you. You're gonna be at eye level. You're going to have the client follow your finger without them moving their head. So you're going to make a large H with your fingers. You're always going to go back to center. So normal is you're looking at their eyes and their eyes should have a normal gaze following your finger while you make an H. Abnormal is that while they're following your finger as you're making this H, that they possibly have nice stagmas, which is a that shaking movement of their eye. And again, PERLA. So pupils equal round reactive to light and accommodation. So they should be three to five millimeters diameter for the pupils. That is the expected range. So expected findings for eyes. The eyes are gonna be parallel to one another on the face. There's no protrusion or sunken appearance with the eyes. The eyebrows are symmetric. The sclera is going to be moist, glossy, and clear. A light tone skin color um, will have a white appearance for the sclera where a dark skin tone client it could slightly be yellow. The conjunctiva is pink and clear, no lesions or edema. Okay, so there's your conjunctiva. So again, you're gonna take your thumb and just gently pull down the lower lid so you can look at the sclera and the conjunctiva. Pupils, so again, you're gonna perform perla and they should be three to five millimeters in size. When directing the client to gaze across the room, again, both pupils should dilate equally for a far object and constrict with a near object. Shining the light in one eye, both pupils should constrict. So you can see this conjunctiva, you can see the vessels, um, or not conjunctiva, the sclera, you can see some vessels and that is also an expected finding. Now, expected variations for older adults. The eye may appear sunken due to the loss of periorbital fat. 
The eyelids, they may look edematous due to the fat redistributing. The pupils may also be smaller and react slower to light. And then loss of elasticity associated with aging, causing the lower lid to turn outward or inward, causing irritation. So this picture, you can see that the eyelashes are actually touching the eye and the cornea. So it's actually um, irritating that area. Unexpected findings, so bulging eyes. That's unaffected. There possibly maybe, maybe there's a thyroid problem. Um, or there might be something else. Cross-eyed is an unexpected finding. Unable to move their eyebrows, a facial nerve damage, flaking of the skin in the eyebrows, it could be due to a skin disorder. Redness of the eyelids could be an infection or inflammation. Edema of the eyelids could be trauma, kidney or cardiac disease. Drooping of the eyelid, again, edema or damage to a cranial nerve. So this is a drooping of the eyelid on this left side of him. Inability to close the eyelids could be lid edema, nerve paralysis, excessively protruding eyeballs. Those could be the reasons. The sclera, the color may be yellow or green. It could mean liver disease. Unexpected continue is the subconjunctiva hemorrhage. So this is an increased pressure within the eye, like coughing or vomiting that causes it. Uh, conjunctivitis. So the inflammation of the conjunctiva, which it will be red and has drainage. So it could be due to a bacterial or a viral infection, could be an allergy, chemical injury to an eye. That looks like a bacterial infection. Unequal pupil size, so at rest and with reaction to light, could be a sign of a central nervous injury. Pupils are dilated and they do not react to light. So this is an, if you have a client that this is their change, you need to address this. So as you see here, this pupil is constricted and this pupil is not. So these are unequal. So did they have a head injury and that's causing that CNS injury? Cloudy pupils, so could be cataracts, um, loss of transparency of the lens of the eye. So perfect cat or cataracts right here, good example. Dilated pupils at rest, so larger than seven millimeters could be an eye disease or a central nervous disorder. So they could have a brain bleed. Um, they could have um, a, in, they, this is an emergency. If you see someone who have a, you'll hear this as like a blown out um, pupil, but um, you need to address this immediately. If you see someone who has, different pupil sizes you need to address it and especially assess them how are they doing are they alert oriented are they following commands how's their gcs see how this is coming back into play how is their glaucoma glasgow coma scale um so constricted pupils at rest so less than three millimeters could be an opioid intoxication so if i see clients that has a constricted pupil like this uh, and they're equal on both sides I might think initially okay first what's their age if they're not older and they're a younger person then I'm going to start thinking okay do you use opioids and maybe they've been having a prescription for chronic back pain or chronic pain and that's why they've been using opioids so changes in the age and adult for eyes they have a decreased visual acuity their peripheral vision is decreased. They have the diminished ability to see close. Their decreased accommodation to light, that glare and darkness. They don't like to drive at night. Um, they're unable to really differentiate colors. Intolerance to glare. Their lens will uh, possibly be yellowing. 
They have a thin gray white ring surrounding the cornea, um, loss of the lateral eyebrow, and they can have cataracts. So assessment of someone who has a vision problem, so subjective data, do they have any blurry vision? Blind spots, do they ever experience diff vision difficulties, one or both eyes? Do they have a headache? Do they have any pain in their eye? Have they had any injuries? Do they wear glasses or contacts and how do they take care of those? When was their last visit? Do they have an, um, a history of allergies? Do you, does your vision change suddenly or slowly? When did the symptoms start? And then to go back with our objective data, you're going to inspect. You're going to look for that redness, lesions, abrasion, um, the drainage, what's the color, the amount, size and shape of pupils, perla, how's their vision? Um, do the Snellen chart, do the six cardinal fields of gaze, see how they are doing, do your assessment. Once you're done completing your assessment, document your findings. You possibly might need to provide large print reading material to them. Now, if they had a trauma to their eye, apply an eye patch to protect that eye um, until a provider um, evaluates them. But if they possibly have a foreign body in their eye, you're not going to apply um, an eye patch. You want to address that right away. So let's talk about headaches because if they're having head issues, neck problems, um, if they're having eye problems, maybe they have they are associated with a headache, possibly. So onset, we're gonna ask them when did this headache start? Gradual, over hours, or a day? Suddenly, over minutes, less than an hour? Have you ever had this kind of headache before? Where is your headache? Is the pain localized on one side, or does it travel? Is it all over? How would you? Uh, describe it so throbbing, aching, mild, mild, or severe. Uh, course of duration do you when do your headaches occur? Do they make you sleep? How long do they last? Um, precipitating factors what brings it on? Activity, exercise, sleep, um, alcohol if they're emotionally upset, anxiety, maybe lack of sleep, maybe you've had an injury, um, note signs of any depression. Okay, any associated factors in relation to other symptoms? So to go back to what we talked about earlier in this lecture was maybe they were having sinus problems and maybe that's why they have a headache. Um, so like nausea, vomiting, vision changes, pain with bright lights, neck pain, stiffness, fever, weakness. Do you have any other illnesses or take any other medications? Does your family have headaches? Frequency, how often for females are they in relation to their menstrual cycle? Um, what seems to help them? Medications, sleep, and if medications do help, what type of medications? Uh, coping strategies, so how does it affect their life, their ability to work, their home life, their sociability? Do they have a head injury or a blow to their head? Do they feel dizzy? Do they have neck pain, limited range of motion? Any lumps or swelling? Um, any head or neck surgery? Now for our aging adults, big things is how does it affect their daily activities? Dizziness, neck pain. Are they able to drive, perform work, do housework, sleep, look down when using the stairs? So just a couple more things about our aging adults. So their facial bones and orbital orbits appear more prominent because the facial skin sags resulting in a decreased elasticity, decreased subcutaneous fat, and decreased moisture in the skin. Their skin's very dry. Um, the lower face, the lower part of their face may appear smaller, especially if they've lost their teeth and they don't have dentures. Um, just a couple more things. So on the head, their temple arteries may look twisted or prominent. Um, there may be a mild rhythmic tremor of their head. That may be normal. See, no tremors are benign, okay, um, but include head nodding and tongue protrusion. If some teeth have been lost, they're, again, their lower face will look unusually small. Their mouth may look sunken in. Um, especially if they don't wear their dentures, if they have them. 
Um, so a little bit more. So the neck may show concave curve on the jaw. The head and jaw are extended forward to compensate for that hyphosis of the spine. So during your exam, direct them to perform range of motion slowly. And when you're changing positions for these older adults, you want to change positions really slowly because they get dizzy. Um, they may have prolapse of submandibular glands, which may be mistaken for a tumor. Um, but drooping of their submandibular glands will feel soft and be present bilaterally when you're assessing them. Now, this is just an example on how to document. Um, so take a look at this. If you don't know what some of the words are, please look them up. Uh, but this is the conclusion of this lecture. If you have any questions, let me know. But really dive into health assess on ATI and follow along with this PowerPoint. Follow along with the textbook. Continually studying. You can't study like two, three days before the test. You have to study once you start learning that material in class. That first, first lecture, that's the day you're studying for your test. Okay, guys. Well, let me know if you need anything.